we're very proud to be a part of. Um, all the proceeds of this festival go towards Quorum, which is your local renewable energy company that are um, committed to a 2020 vision of 100% renewable energy in Mullumbimby, and that's something we certainly at Hip Santos are very proud to get behind. Um, our speaker today is Robert Pekin, and he's a man around these parts who needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. Uh, it's um, something I really want to do is thank you all for supporting this festival and, and for paying the money and the ticket price to come here because you know we're, we're still stuck in this crazy economic system and, and we're going to be in it for a few years yet. And if we want to change things, the, the most powerful weapon we have as, as individuals is what we do with our money and what we spend our money on. So big thank you to, to, to all of you here for spending your money and coming in and supporting this festival and, and seeing if we can't make some really good changes in the world and bring some renewable energy to the table. Okay, um, I mean, we just to, as an aside, we've, we've seen the, the difference these sort of things make. You'll remember recently with uh, the Adani mine in Westpac and the amount of pressure that was brought to bear by saying, well, we're going to switch where we put our money and move it to organisations that are switched into where the future needs to go. And they came out and then after all of that pressure, they've refused to fund that mine. And that's another step in the right direction. And uh, we stopped the Adani mine and we do everything we can. So thanks again for putting your money in the right place. So on to Robert. Um, Robert is, um, was, a, was a dairy farmer, um, I think fourth, fifth generation. And he went through the deregulation of the 90s and, and lost the family farm. It was, a, it was a devastating thing to happen. But he didn't let it get him down. He picked himself up and he got involved in community supported agriculture. And he started Food Connect in Brisbane in 2005. Which is an amazing thing because it, it directly connects your, your farmers to your consumers. And it means that our farmers that are, are growing things in an ecologically sensitive way, in a sustainable way, are supported and they're able to continue farming and, and they don't have this price pressure coming from the supermarkets and all the other costs in the supply chain. So, reducing those costs. So he's been involved in that. He's talking to us today about transitioning our food system strategy and the ways that we can make the changes in a practical way. So I introduce you now. I'd like a big round of applause for you all to Robert Pekin. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to start off by just um, just just don't do that first slide. <laughs> Um, yeah, just uh, want to uh, acknowledge uh, Murray, the previous entertainer. Password. Password. <laughs> 55, uh, capital G, small r, 33, three, small r. <laughs> no, you're all not. <laughs> Did that work? Uh, 55, capital G, Small, uh, oh, actually, is it capital G? I have to be there. Uh, is it capital G? Mine. No capital. So 55, small g, small ass, 3 3 R. That's where we live, 55 Greer Street, <laughs> Salisbury. So, um, yeah, just uh, acknowledging Murray, it was a great way to be chilled out coming in to speak after a, a music, musician of that calibre. It was beautiful music, um, and we should have more of that sort of cultural uh, engagement and chilling out sort of music that uh, brings us closer to our hearts, uh, rather than always being in our heads all the time, as, as we tend to do. Oh, thank you, is that the clicker? Thank you. Um, I'd also uh, um, like to congratulate the organisers on just an amazing lineup of speakers. It's been incredible. I uh, was here yesterday and all the tents had, uh, you know, world class, like these speakers that are speaking at present are world class and really uh, knowledgeable in their field. It, it's, been, it's been very inspiring to come here and listen to such an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, and uh, so well done to the organisers for, for getting them along and well done to the organisers for putting this putting this on. I know it's it's not easy to put on an event like this, um, particularly where you have to ask for a, a reasonable, or there's no sponsorship, or not a great amount of sponsorship. And thanks for Santos to sponsoring um, uh, this festival and, and sponsoring me to come down and uh, hopefully uh, pass on something or other that you might be able to take home. I'd like to also uh, 
um, share, I just share also that I'm, I'm white and I'm male um, and I'm an ex-dairy farmer. So uh, from that context is how I'm going to present today. So it's not, I, I, I'm not a, uh, um, you know, I'm not endowed with a lot of uh, the incredible intellect and academic profiles that a lot of the speakers have. I'm not also endowed with the, with the beautiful gift that women bring to the world in terms of their heart connection to, to land. But in saying that, I'd like to acknowledge the women that have uh, crafted me and made me more aware of my responsibility. Uh, since I started Food Connect and was left the farm as a dairy farmer, I lost the farm, and quite an angry white man, and homeless for quite a few years, uh, I, uh, I've, I've had to, there's been a, a bit of shaping going on, and most of that shaping has been through um, the women who have come into my life, particularly in the years of Food Connect, some of the staff, most of our staff were, were female and they really pointed me towards a different direction than what I was thinking of when I first set up, set up Food Connect as this multi-farmer CSA. So I want to acknowledge them. I also want to acknowledge the Indigenous Elders, um, both past and present and into the future. Uh, my, um, my association with the Indigenous people goes back to when I, when I took over the farm from my dairy farmer, uh, from my father, um, in Colac in Western Victoria. Um, when I knew the two volcanoes that my farm was a part of, one was 40,000 years old, the other one was 2.1 million years old, um, I, even though all the indigenous people didn't exist anymore, the collagens, um, there was something that was reaching out to me with the people who visited my farm and went to the top of the hill and used to do all these you know, crazy things I thought were really crazy. And me as a standard you know, um, chauvinistic uh, white Catholic um, uh, you know, footballer who'd, grow, who'd been around men all of his life. This was a new experience. So that that experience of being brought into contact with the, the original people who used to occupy my land brought me a spiritual awakening and also uh, uh, a deepening of of um, and now a deep respect for how they govern this land. As you can see, There's many, 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 many countries, and yet they didn't need a police force, an army of lawyers. Um, a defence force, uh, they lived in equality, you know, the leader lived with the rest of the tribe. Um, they had amazing custom and laws about food and land and respect and totems for the whole country. Um, and these, these, these are very sophisticated um, ways of living with, with the land and with people. And uh, so, I, I, you know, my respect to, to, to what they have endured and now they're coming out and now we're saying we, were, we should be really listening to them, we should be putting them at the head of the table, particularly around governance. How do we actually govern this country if we're going to survive, survive as a human race? So that's my sort of um, story in terms of a lot of my learnings and how I put together Food Connect and a lot of what you'll hear in this today's presentation is as a result of my exploration and conversations with Indigenous people in Australia and how we can embody some or embed some of their stuff into what I do as what I do as a businessman, I suppose. So, um, uh, so yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I'm in charge. Sorry. <laughs> Quite often forget that. Do I push this one? There we go. So, so this is Food Connect Foundation's mission: um, a world where everyone has access to health, freshly ecologically grown food that is fair to growers, eaters, and the planet in short, to practically transform the food system. The reason why I put in there practically is because there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of knowledge. We know how to do this stuff, but actually how do we translate that to on the ground? And there's lots of examples from around the world, amazing examples from around the world. But in the Australian context, it's very, very different. We don't have the food culture that Europe has and UK. We don't have the great soils that the USA has and Canada has. We don't have the high concentration of populations. Um, we have a very, very different country. So how do we do that in the Australian context? How do we translate those amazing examples? And we heard some yesterday from Anya and from Carol and from Helena and all the speakers yesterday on how to do that. Um, so uh, we've had a journey. Um, we started 13 years ago um, and it's a, a distributed... Uh, our, our idea was i have been setting up CSAs for seven years prior to setting up Food Connect, and including my own in Tasmania. I had my own CSA in Tasmania. Um, and whilst it was a fantastic model and engaged with some wonderful um, people in Tasmania and the other ones that I set up, I couldn't see that 
um, scaling to the point where all farmers could have this experience of a direct connection with the, the person who ate their food. And I felt that was critical, that the person eating the food has to have a direct connection to the farmer, and the farmer has to have that direct eye-to-eye -eye relationship, responsibility, and level of commitment. And we need that tension in the food system. So when I landed in Brisbane, um, the multi-farmer CSA model appealed to me as something that in the Australian context may possibly work. Um, so we put it together with seven. There was well, seven farmers originally. Now there's about 80 farmers, and we've gone through a process where uh, we've... Sorry, what is CSA? Oh, community supported agriculture. So, yeah, the concept of CSA... Thanks for asking that question. So the concept of CSA comes out of two philosophies. The Schumacher philosophy, the philosophy of economics is or small is beautiful and economics as if people matter and the philosophy of, of Steiner of uh, associative economics of where how can you have a social not cooperative workings but associative workings how do you actually put that on the ground in the in 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 a, in a real way because both those organizations were in their heads really writing a lot of books doing a lot of meditation study groups all that sort of stuff but when they met in America the Schumacher Society and the Anthroposophical Society met together and said how do we actually put this on the ground and they come up with the CSA context or the CSA model but at the same time in Japan Taiki which is a similar model was already existing and there was also similar types of this risk sharing relationship between the farmer and the consumer happening in Switzerland and in parts of Europe so it was happening in a multiple places all at one time unfolding so that's the community supported agriculture CSA um, but in the Australian context what I was butting my head up against was there were a lot of farmers who were wanting to grow who were growing three or four things um, they didn't want to grow 30 things, which is what you needed to satisfy a, a city or a customer base. You really needed that. The other thing, even the farmers who are growing 70 things, like I grew 70 varieties of things throughout the year in Tasmania, it was on a weekly basis, so really tough planning and a lot of hard work put into growing that amount of food for that amount of people sequentially week by week right throughout the whole year. In the US they have the fortune of having seasons over there. Um, but we don't really have seasons here in Australia. Maybe Tasmania does, um, but here in Australia we don't really have those seasons that actually shut us down, like snow. Um, so I wanted to. So um, even those farmers who are growing ample produce still struggled on satisfying the expectations of the customer base here in in Australia. We we, we haven't been hit with anything really serious. We haven't had a, furious, a, a serious food outbreak. We haven't had. We haven't had anything that's really scared the population. We, we live um, in relative luxury. We live in relative abundance and no one really takes things seriously. Also, Australians are pretty apathetic at taking on problems. And they're pretty apathetic at, at, at taking things seriously. Take, for instance, we've got Coles, Woolworths and 7-Eleven have all been caught unconscionable practice for paying staff half the rate, yet everyone still shops there. So we just don't, we just don't get off our bucks. So I wanted to have a model that actually got people off their butts, basically. So the multi-farmer model with engagement with customers. So the, the key to me was having a model that, it, that, it, that basically engage, that involved eaters in, in the food system in a way that they actually participated. So we developed this model called the City Cousin Food Distribution Model. So whereby we aggregated all the food, put it into the boxes, everyone ordered online, and then it was shipped out to, well, now I mean, 80 drop-off spots all around Brisbane, and the customers had to come there to pick them up, pick up their food. So that brought this engagement into the food system. It also said we're not going to home deliver. We don't want people to stay in their boxes and be isolated and not know how to, you know, what healthy food is or not know how to feed your baby. We wanted, so we had to find those women, most of them are women, those participants in the community who wanted to participate in a, in, a, in a food system that actually took about systemic change. It was looking at the whole system rather than issues based and took a preventative um, action to, uh, to, to solving some of these intractable problems. So uh, it's been a journey of all sorts of things and you know, in, in terms of personal growth, that's one of the biggest journeys we all have to go on to. Um, so, uh, um, so these are some of the things that, that uh, um, we've set up over the years. The Open Food Network, I'm on the board of the Open Food Network software system that we designed. We realised that we, we weren't a software company, so these guys took it on. Two wonderful women in uh, Melbourne. 
Um, Slow Money, we're founding members of Slow Money. When, you, when, when I read Woody Tash's book, Slow Money, if you haven't read it, you'll realise it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a life-changing book when you realise that if we don't focus on food and agriculture, uh, we're effed. There's nothing else as important, and I'll talk about that a little bit, I'll cover it while, a little bit later on. Um, the other thing that was happening in Australia was there was all these disparate farming groups, farming organisations. I mean, we've got eight organic certifiers in Australia, all, all um, fighting for their own, you know, all brands, all, all in, this, in this corporate system of protecting their brand. This dividing and conquering was existing, and I wanted to set up a system that didn't, it wasn't just about organics, and it wasn't just about one organic certifier, it was about all farmers who wanted to practice good farming methodologies. I did not want to divide and conquer. So I had to take on the organic industry because they wanted, they didn't like that. And even some of our farmers didn't like the fact that I was putting organic produce in a box with produce from a farmer who wasn't certified. So I had to take on those farmers in those early days. And, and we've come a long way since those days. There's a lot more awareness of, of um, the whole food system and how farmers can participate in that. Particularly now we've got regenerative agriculture as, a, as an aspirational model, whereas organics has left us behind. It's not aspirational. It hasn't taken on uh, packaging. It hasn't taken on food miles. It hasn't taken on power. Like it sees the holy grail as getting stocked on coals and woolworths, which is the seat of all inequitable power in food distribution. In Australia, that is where the main inequity is caused by the distribution system of coals and woolies and, and Metcash, who run IGA. So, um, so fair food. So we had to set up the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, we were working on how do we actually bring together all these disparate farmer groups, all these food groups, all these consumer groups, all these, you know, there was lots of academics talking about this stuff. Um, there was lots of environmental groups who didn't want to have anything to do with farmers, or, or not much at all. Um, a lot of NGOs, the same sort of thing, even politicians, even the Greens, did not really want to have much to do with farmers 10 years ago. They really didn't like farmers. They didn't, they didn't like them. But now we're seeing that shift. So when um, the Labor Party and Coles and Woolworths put together or they announced this national food plan, that was our hook. We were sitting at a pub reading this on the front page of the Sydney, um, the, whatever the paper is in Sydney, and we realised this was our hook. We actually had to write our own food plan. And that was the coalescing force. And a whole bunch of people come around, form the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance, and it's in its biggest you know, product, I suppose, is, is writing the People's Food Plan. And it was written in a way that we really didn't care whether the government looked at it. We certainly wanted to take notice of it, but our main objective was to write something that the people could write. And Carol Richards is one of the main authors sitting in the back there. Um, so we've got this amazing um, uh, uh, ability, Australians, we have, we, we're, we're punching way above our weight under the circumstances with the, with the power shift, particularly in our political policy and, uh, and our distribution side of things. Um, so, so there's been a lot of things that have been set up that I've been a part of, that Food Connect's been a part of, building what's called now the ecosystem. In, um, in the social enterprise world, they call it the ecosystem. Um, but it still isn't enough. And we've, won a, we've won a few awards. It still isn't enough. We're still a gnat's nut in terms of shifting how people eat. It's still a poof teeth. Like, it doesn't really have much of an impact. It's very, very small. You, and the spin, you see it in the spin, Aussie Farmers Direct, uh, a whole bunch of organic um, box schemes in Brisbane all spin this story of local. Even all the restaurants and cafes, and some I know incredibly well are really good friends of mine and they have this headline on their menu, local, seasonal, organic, and not one single thing on there is local, seasonal or organic. And we have this apathy of actually taking them on and challenging, and challenging that status quo. So we're still not really achieving much. Now wouldn't it be lovely, I don't know what this next slide, what this next slide is. Um, oh, this is a bit of the, you know, seasonal farm tours. Uh, we employ disabled, people with disability. We've had an adopt-a-farmer scheme with schools that BFA took on and, and used it around Australia. Um, uh, you know, this is some of our farmers, um, whatever that says. Uh, City Cousin Network. Um, so we've done all this community engagement and community development and a lot broader things to build a food system that everyone could feel participant in. But it's, 
but it's broken, and I've said that. Um, all this was covered yesterday. Even the organic industry, the concentration in organics is disgusting, the amount of businesses that sell out. They start up a business and then five or six years later, it's gone um, to some corporate, and that person's run away with a, with a bunch of money to do what? Who knows what? Um, we saw it with Macro and Whole Foods. Uh, they did that. Um, you know, we've got this lack of diversity in what we eat, obesity, 1.6 billion people um, are now obese in the world. Uh, and this in an Australian context, we've got this ageing farming population. Um, so, wouldn't it be lovely if, if we weren't talking about food system as something, as an alternative? Like we're seeing now, um, we're seeing the uh, solar. So if we look at the four big baddies in the world, um, energy, uh, transport, the built environment, and food and agriculture. Those three, out of, out of those four, three of them have started to decouple from fossil fuels. Particularly energy. Energy was solar, wind, hydro, a whole bunch of other things is now, on, a, on a, you know, it's decoupled that it's actually now prices are coming down. So it's been an amazing success. And I was in a tent over here yesterday where they were saying they didn't even talk about it. It's not even, the word alternative isn't even spoken anymore. It's now accepted as mainstream. Politicians fight to get front stage to talk about what solar schemes they're going to put in place. Wouldn't it be lovely if food and agriculture was in that space? was in that position and that's what we've got to aspire towards is food and agriculture is front and centre because it is the only thing that really matters. So the same with um, with uh, transport, you know, we've got electric cars, um, we've got more public transport, there's a whole bunch of things going on in that space where it's starting to decouple from fossil fuels. It certainly hasn't done much in terms of power um, except for Tesla um, and a couple of those new companies coming on board. And uh, the built environment in particular as well is another one that started to decouple with building projects like Nightingale, the Nightingale model and other models that are highly distributed ownership models of residential apartment buildings with no car parks. Um, really exciting develop development that's happening right across Australia. So we're seeing the built environment is starting to take on this challenge. If you ignore those shocking suburbs um, in Melbourne and Sydney, all those blights on society with black roofs and no eaves, um, you know, where the where the people who built them should be lined up and shot for doing that sort of stuff, for actually putting people in, in those houses where they're now energy dependent. It's unbelievable. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> probably a developer here is there who does that. Or probably someone up here is retiring at Byron Bay who built those bloody developments down in Melbourne. So, so one of the things, um, as I said before, uh, is, is I try to bring things down to something really simple that we can grasp hold of. So this is the Sustainable Development Goals, um, admirable set of goals, 17, 17 sort of categories. Um, but what it fails to acknowledge, and what a lot of things fail to acknowledge, is a whole of system view. This is still issues based, and we're still seeing this in the divestment movement. People are, are divesting out of something or other, and they're reinvesting into an issue. So they're impact investing in Aboriginal health, or they're impact investing all notable causes they're investing into solar. Um, they're investing into um, uh, regional um, economics, or, or these sort of things. They're not taking a whole of systems perspective and bringing it down to a simple concrete. <laughs> She's hard to compete against that. <laughs> um, so I don't know where this next slide. So I just want to bring it, it down to three fundamental things that we need to focus on. So the first one is decoupling from fossil fuels. Food system is still the only thing wedded to fossil fuels. If you look at food miles, food miles in Australia is still about 70,000 kilometres for the average 23 items in a basket weekly. It's, it's, uh, um, 20, 23,000 is food miles, is, is actual road transport miles, the rest is flight. So it's an incredible amount of mileage. Whereas you look at Food Connect's mileage, it's uh, for our 23 items equivalent to those baskets, it's, it's somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 miles. It's an amazing difference. It's about 10 tonne of CO2 emissions equivalent saved per week, as opposed to the 13 kilowatts on our roof, which only saves us about 19 tonne a year. So it's a massive saving in food miles just by having a localised food system. So we've got a long way to go. Farmers, and farmers are already up to this stuff. They're farming regeneratively. They're starting to understand that they need to not till the earth, to not put a plough in, to not put a rotary hoe in. 
they're starting to wake up to this fact. But how do we decouple the whole food and agricultural system? Because the, the thing is that at the moment, food and agriculture contributes about 30% to CO2 emissions. In the next five to 10 years, it'll be contributing 70%. 70%, that's just CO2 emissions. We already contribute way above that in terms of water pollution, obesity, you know, so there's a whole bunch of things that we listed yesterday, I don't have to go into them. The other one is how do we develop businesses, um, structured businesses that have equity, gender equity, financial equity, uh, ownership equity. Um, how, we can, how can we have a, an equitable food distribution system? And then the third one is the final frontier, and this is the big kahuna for all of us, is to, to get along. How do we actually get along? Because unless we get along, it's going to be, it, it, this is, this, and this is the hard work that we have to do. Or we could, I could call it hard. It's hard for me, but probably for a lot of other people, it's, it's probably a lot easier to get along. But how do we actually construct models that enable people to be coerced into getting along. And we do, we need a bit of a toe up the bum. People need to be kicked off, needed to be kicked up the bum many times. And it hasn't done me any harm whatsoever. It's made me a better person. So how do we have models that shake people up, that put the toe right up their bum in a nice gentle way, but brings them on board this this final, this, this train, this train that we have to get on? G'day. Um, so these are the three things. So I want to simplify, you know, because we could we could bring it down to a dirty dozen. We could um, there's so many issues we could look at, but we need to take a systems perspective, because as we're seeing with you know marvelous social enterprises like um, Thank You Water or uh, Who Gives a Crap, um, they they're not addressing systemic issues. They're not looking at things from pattern language point of view, from patterns. Indigenous people talk about patterns. Patterns are really important. If you don't look at things from a pattern point of view, you don't know what the side effects are. If you just take a single issue, the side effects, you've got to look at the side effects. So you have to have a systems view of the whole picture before you undertake any activities. So, getting along. Um, so the key strategies for us is this, uh, so, um, I'll just talk from this here for a moment. Can I go back? That one there. So I'll leave that. I'll leave that up there because it's it's worth. Uh, and, and I woke up this morning and I, and I said because um, we've got the twelve permaculture principles, um, and even they're hard for. And most of us probably done a permaculture course. Even they're hard to conceptualise in our head when we're making a decision. You know, what are those twelve principles? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, shit. Uh, what are they? You know, like it's out of our head. So we need to reduce things to something really simple. And I woke up this morning and went, oh, these are very similar to the three uh, permaculture ethics, care for land, care for people, and fair share. So you could, so whatever it is, and this is what you have to do yourselves, you have to bring something down where you have, where you can grasp what it is that you think is needed to simplify things so you can take that system view. So you have a filter to run your decision making through. Um, really, really simple stuff. Because a lot of people out there will make this really complex. And humans, we try to make things complex. It's almost like uh, 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 there's something that urges us, if we can make it really complex, then we can, we can make ourselves up to be experts. And then we've got to make this, all of this work involved in solving the problem. Whereas it's not, it's not hard. It's not hard. And we've got the models out there to, to show us how to do this stuff. We've just got to get off our butts. So, how do, we, how do we build a system using those three principles that takes us from silos to systems? A lot of us probably exist in silos. Um, from problems to patterns, to seeing the patterns. Um, from market-based um, to true cost or human rights-based. So taking away the commodity that food is and turning it into a human rights or a human, uh, humanising the food system. So it's a basic right. Um, from education to engagement, to, to participation. So we have a lot of people who are, who are educating and educating and educating and educating, but we have to have models where they actually participate because that's where the real education starts. That's where the real learning of how to get along starts. You can't learn how to get along with someone by listening to a lecture. You have to get out there and participate in the hard stuff, not the easy stuff, in the governance, in thinking about how do I share the financial resources? How do I share the profits? How does an investor sit down with me and have a conversation and say, well, normally I'd expect 10%, but you're saying you only want 3%? You're only going to return me 3%? How does that work? You know, so having those conversations and giving, giving 
um, those investors time to participate in the in the in the um, in the solutions. Um, from you know going from food from nowhere to food from somewhere. You know we've all got probably all of us have got solar roofs on our house, but do we know much about the beer? Do we know much about the bread? You know, is there a solar roof on the bread on the bakery that bakes our bread? Um, where does that grain come from? How is it ground? You know, was it was it someone peddling a push bike and grinding that grain, or was it some thumping big machine that heated up the grain and you lost all the nutrition and all you're eating is a, you know, is is just some white thing sitting on the on the on the table? So, how do you actually get to that point where you're actually um, you 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 know you not only know. Um, uh, you, you know every single thing that goes into your mouth. You know where it comes from, you know who made it, you actually own it. That, that's the system we're talking about. Something aspiring. Not this bloody organic thing, this industry thing that's running around. Um, from food banks, from food banks to community food centres. Food banks are not system-led. They're an issue. There's that many farmers that receive parcels from food banks, the very same farmers that should have been paid for that produce in the first place. And yet we have food banks in Melbourne and Sydney that, that are exploiting leftover produce from the, the standards that the supermarkets set. They're exploiting farmers. So we need to move from that food bank model. It's a, it's a great example of side effects. It is not taking any, and actually the model, the business model around food banks now is so bad that it's actually not it's actually counterproductive to addressing the food system needs. So we need to move to community food centres where the farmers are paid in the process. Um, from connection to collaboration, so it's easy to connect with someone. Here you go, good on you, you know, here's your, here's your bread. But where do we co actually collaborate? What skills have we all got? And this is getting back to the community supported agriculture principles. One of the key principles of community supported agriculture is let the farmer grow the food and then the community, the accountants, the marketers, the storytellers, um, the, uh, all those people, they all get in behind that farm and participate in, in a food system that they all want. So, so it's a lot, more, you know, a lot more work to go to that collaborative stage. From centralised to distributed, um, from annuals to perennials, and this is the big one. This is probably the, you know, probably the last thing that we'll, we'll achieve before we all get along, is shifting our now, uh, the food we eat from annual agriculture, so stuff you have to plough up and, well not even annual, it's every three months, you know, a lettuce or a rocket seed or whatever else, to actually eating completely from plants that actually grow all year, many years in a row. And not knocking down, you know, oranges every 10 years because a new variety has come on board, but actually eating a whole perennial diet. And there was a wonderful cooking class over there yesterday on how to cook with perennials. So we've got the skills, we've got the people who know how to do this stuff, yeah. Um, really amazing stuff. So that, that there, and this is an indigenous thing. The indigenous people, you know, they had um, uh, yam daisies. They ate yam daisies, they cultivated them, they farmed them, they actually had grains and they used to stoop grain and they were, they were baking bread 20,000 years ago, all that sort of stuff. But it was all, it was grasses that grew naturally. They, they, we didn't have, they didn't have to sell them, they just grew. They, ma they managed the landscape where those grains grew. You all, you've all read, um, uh, if, if, if you're all a bit confused by me saying that they were the uh, baking bread 20,000 years and amazing cakes, these amazing millet cakes 20,000 years ago, um, then you're a bit, yeah, what's that? Sorry, and still are. And still are, and still are, that's right, they've revived it now, yeah. So if you haven't read the book Black Emu, uh, uh, a really, really important read, um, that book. So how do we shift from annuals? How do we get our farmers? How, and, and, and the farmers want to do this stuff. They know it's useless ploughing the ground and putting in bloody lettuces and then a flood comes through or, you know, some freaky uh, weather event and all of a sudden their crops buggered. You know, they want to have crops that they can have leisure time, put their feet up and wander out and prune occasionally um, and then go and harvest and, and, and sell. So we have to move to this perennial based system where we're not trashing the earth we're not, we're not exploiting um, labour um, and we're not using fossil fuels. That's the, 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 the final one. Um, from, uh, you know, from divestment to regenerative investment. So really thinking about your reinvestment of money. Where do you invest your money? And everyone is an investor. Not just the wealthy people or the people who have divested, but everyone is an investor. Become invested. Um, um, from net negative to net positive, 
So we see a lot of social enterprises and food businesses talk about uh, you know, the positive impacts they're, they're making, but what about the net positive impacts? Because I can go into a social enterprise or any business and they can talk about their positive impacts, but when I look at the externalities that they've socialised, um, it's actually a net loss. They're a net loser. So we have to get businesses on that progression to, to look at zero and then net positive. Um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things, from monocultures to polycultures. Uh, um, so, a world, basically a world that works for all. So, how do we do this? How do we bring this to the ground in a practical way? So, these are our, so we're developing a food hub, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, that's, that's sort of built on our experience of building Food Connect over the years, and the replication, we replicated the model right around Australia, and in other places, the software's gone global. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. But as I said before, it's still a nat nut. It still hasn't really penetrated where we need to go if we're going to, if we, if we as humans are going to survive on this planet. Food and agriculture is the final thing. So the key strategies are: how do we actually build a system where all the food waste is utilised, is either value added, it's never wasted, and the final thing is it might go back to a farm. How do we actually build food systems like coffee? 98% of coffee is wasted. Um, Beer, huge amount of that, uh, that uh, grain is wasted, is thrown into landfill. So how do we develop models, business models, business collaborations that actually work together to take advantage of the, the not waste? Um, how do we build a model that has community ownership and governance, where everyone's participating in the governance of that business, of that enterprise, of that community enterprise? How do we have collaborative procurement? So this is, gets back to the smallest beautiful principle. How do we, how do we sell into the big um, institutional um, clients? So hospitals, aged care centres, councils, big business, um, childcare centres, schools. There's a myriad of them out there where uh, the, the monopolisation of that market is huge. Bidvest. Bidvest pretty much dominate that thing. Bidvest, spotless. Um, how do we actually get into that market without losing the quality, without losing this connection to detaching our souls from fossil fuels? Push the wrong button. Um, how do we have a focus on perennials? How do we get this focus onto perennials? And it's place-based, so it's embedded in community. It's not about far-off places, it's not about the people who like organics or who get us. As, as you know, ecological warriors out there, how do we actually, how do we actually get this type of produce? And I was talking to Kate yesterday. Is and this is where research comes in. Is we don't know the pe the number of people in this district who are food insecure, but we know they're there. We know there's people who can't afford the sort of produce that we're talking about. So how do we actually uh, deliver food to them? Um, that's empowering, so it's not coming from a food bank. This is another thing about food banks. Food banks is disempowering. You get free food, you know, a lot of people don't like getting free food because it's disempowering. So how do we have a system that actually services all people in this region, not just the people who get us? How do we have a place-based model? And um, how do we uh, use that business or how does that educate people. How, what's the educative process involved in that business? Um, and, and then applying that and, and using research and applying that research to other models around Australia because we're a big country and we can't just go out there and cookie cutter this or replicate it or do those other things. We have to come up with um, ways that this can be applied or these ideas can be applied in place in other places all around Australia. So that's, uh, that's a bit about um, where I wanted to go, um, and this is some of the stuff, and Anya spoke about this yesterday, uh, the, um, the multiplier effect of local economy. So I think you know all this, I wasn't gonna, I was gonna talk about it, it was well and truly covered. If you, didn't, if you don't know anything about local business multipliers or all these multiplier effects, um, speak to Anya. <laughs> um, I just mentioned a bit about low food models, so I'm really struggling to see the screen there. Um, you know this this uh, resilient um, this resilient uh, resilient supply scheme. In 2011, the Brisbane floods hit, and I shit myself because it was raining for about two months. It was an incredibly um, it was incredibly wet. wet you know, it was wet, um, and the, 
and it dawned on me when the because we lived in an apartment above the Brisbane River, and um, you know the first day there was sort of you know things floating down the river, and then the next day there was you know pontoons and boats and. Um, and uh, suddenly the flood was on and I suddenly thought, holy shit, my model, this model is stuffed because all our farmers are underneath that rain and are in that flood, in that flood plain. And I really thought that was it. And the, um, so Thursday, we got deliveries out on Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, we couldn't do deliveries, but the flood had started to come down again and we had community people then identifying where everyone was in the floods and then getting food to them on the Friday. And I set a meeting, I said at 12 o'clock on Friday, we're going to have a meeting to decide whether we are going to continue because all our farmers are underneath this rain. And the supermarket's going to do us, you know, because they were getting food from any, anywhere in the world and they weren't underneath this rain. They weren't in this flood path. So I thought, we're stuffed. This is it, the end of the model. <laughs> so I set the meeting for 12 o'clock thinking that it was just doomsday for us and we might as well just, you know, pack our bags and go home. And, and I was pacing the floor where all the, because we've got about 40 staff, and I was pacing the floor and talking to the produce coordinator and talking to this person here, and he's on the phone with the farmers. And every time he'd put down the phone, I'd say, how's he going? He said, yeah, he's fine. You know, he's, he's a small farmer. He's not in the flood path, you know. He got a bit destroyed, but uh, he, they're out there picking, you know. And then the next call, the next call, the next call, um, you know, and they've all got produce. You know, they're all, they're all delivering tomorrow or today. They're sending food down. We ended up having um, about, we fed about 20,000 meals that weekend from the, far, from the produce that the farmers donated into, the, into Brisbane because they're all small farmers. They weren't laser planed, you know, where the, where the floodwaters actually picked up speed and took out their buildings and took out their their you know humongous sheds and they couldn't get the tractors back on the ground for three or four months and Rock Lee was stuffed as well and the whole food distribution system and trucks were held up at Dolby and at Bundaberg and no one could get any food and at Kingaroy the police were guarding raw milk, being selling raw milk. They were actually guarding the farm that was selling raw milk to get into Kingaroy. All these things happened and I thought it was like wow this thing works and that was a really amazing model so that's a really great and, and there's much more academic research into the resilience of local food systems but that flood one I thought was you know really tested us out and we come up um, shining you know in, in so many ways it was an amazing thing we had we had smaller vans so we could duck around we had local knowledge the farmers knew the back ways to get in we had local knowledge in Brisbane we even had a, a, a canoe loaded with food food loot because uh, Campbell Newman, the um, uh, whatever he's called, he um, the whole centralised because they centralised the whole thing. Even ladies who were, who were baking scones got their scones refused because there was four depots in Brisbane where you were to bring. But if it wasn't from a food licensed place, you weren't allowed to bring it in to, for it to be trucked to all these places. And the army were going to deliver food to. There was a there was a suburb in Brisbane that was completely shut off. Supermarket shelves were. And on the radio, you could hear the community going, "Where are we getting our food from?" So a whole bunch of our subscribers got in canoes, went up, loaded them up in the middle of the night, and went around because the cops were guarding, making sure no one would drive through it. Knew because they knew the back ways around and floated it across, paddled across the river to this suburb, and then they rang me about 5 a.m. in the morning. Up this morning, and you could hear the you know, through the squashing through the water. We've made it and all the, you know, the residents were coming at them hungry for all this food. It wasn't a lot of food. I don't know how they shared it. But you know, these this is this is what a local food system, a, a participant empowered model of food system can look like um, in times of really, really tough times. Um, and, uh, there's many stories and there's a bit there's a bit of academic stuff on that, isn't there, Good news. Um, so, uh, so what are the? Oh no, I won't go into that. What's, can I get a time check, please? Yeah, I'm giving you the wind-up. When? Now. now, now. Oh, okay. And then we've got questions. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. probably bring it into the questions. Great. Right. Okay. Beauty. Thanks, Rob. So, um, I'll quickly switch on to this, so you can. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so this is 2016 beyond. So over the last four or five years, we've ex expanded into wholesale, particularly servicing buyers clubs and buyers cooperatives, because we realised that the city cousin model, whilst it was engaging, it was it wasn't allowing the people who we wanted people to create the food system that they wanted and to come from their point of view rather than my point of view, top down, um, you know, white male. 
So the buyers clubs become that. And there's about 40 buyers clubs now in Brisbane, in all different models, shapes and sizes that are really inspiring. But they're still, they're running on volunteerism. They're running on fatigue as well. They're, they've been four years old now. So we've been experimenting with other models of, of food systems deep into community. Um, we've done a, um, a thing last year, I don't know whether that's up there, the Brisbane Food Plan. So we wanted to set our next 10 years, what's our strategy for where Brisbane gets its food from? So we designed a food system based around four lenses, social justice, economics, ecological and, um, and, food and human health. And we come up with five, so there was 13 different food groups and five outcomes basically out of, that, out of that research that set our strategy. So one of the strategies is Food Connect in 10 years time will not get lettuces from outside of Brisbane. We will not get any green sellers, anything like that. It has to come from Brisbane or rooftops or community gardens in Brisbane, we won't sell it. So the farmers who are currently supplying us with lettuce from Gympie and whatever, they have, to, they have to grow greens for Gympie or grow something else for us that fits within this food model. We've got six zones, six global zones. The other thing was Food Connect started off with a three hour model. Three, no food to come from any more than three hours. We went to five hours when I saw the devastation down at Bellingen, how they were being, the biodynamic and organic guys were being screwed over by the supermarkets down there. Um, and now we're looking at the whole globe. So we now are saying we need a much more nuanced version of where food should come from for Brisbane based on those three, three ideas, those three concepts. So what we're doing now is we're developing a food hub. Um, and this is the start of the food hub. This is over the last four, uh, we built a commercial kitchen in 2011. And now it's been, um, there's six other enterprises who collaboratively work with us um, at Food Connect. So we have six businesses, who have been trialling, collaboration, working together, um, sharing a bit of food waste, but basically around organising. And now we're scaling that model up um, to a food hub. This is pretty hard to see, but basically this describes um, the three parts of Food Connect. So there's the foundation, which is a not-for-profit, and there's the for-profit, Food Connect, um, which has four key principles in its constitution, asset lock, two to one wage ratio, 40% must go back to the farmers, of the, of the retail price must go back to the farmers, and all profits back into the business. Um, and then in the middle there is this new thing, we've been doing this for years, but we've separated it out where this is the incubation and, ag and aggregation centre. So this is the food hub that we're developing now. And we've, put, we've got a couple of this investor over there in that other tent that uh, has got the proposal in front of him right now. Um, and that come out of, I might go to the next slide, so this is what we're developing. Um, and before I go into questions, uh, last year, one of the things that, you know, so I don't want to go on too much about the struggles um, and, and how hard it is, um, but to get policy on board, to get investors on board, to get a model that decentralises power and ownership, um, I had to sit down with our landlord. We paid him about a million dollars over the last 10 years and I sat down with him last year and I said, Wayne, we're not, you know, we're, we're just viable. Actually, if I included all of the sort of, um, uh, the wages that I should have been paying all our staff and the wages that Emma and I should have got and the work that's been put on, we're definitely not viable. We, we, and the only way we can access money is if we have an asset, if we have security. We can go to financial, we can say, listen, we're going through a tough time, can you lend us 50 grand? Or can you, uh, we need to buy a refrigerator truck, can you lend us 100 grand? And we want an electric refrigerator truck, we don't want some box down diesel thing. We want one that's $20,000 more than the other people. So we wanted something that actually gave us the power to have those financial conversations. So the landlord said, no, I can't sell you the warehouse. And it's three times bigger than what we're currently in. So it's 2,000 square metres. We're only in about 700 square metres. Anyway, three weeks later, he come back and he said, I thought about it, I'm going to sell it to you. Um, I agree. I love what you've been doing. You've been the best, best uh, tenant over the 10 years. You've always paid pretty much on time. Um, I'm going to have this conversation with you. So he, he, he started that, oh, oh wow, you know, here's, here's someone from the property class, from the investor class. Um, and I've been learning a lot about the investor class, where they don't really want the common people to own, own the property. So he gave us that ability to start to have another conversation. So now we're in the middle of that conversation. So this new phase has all come out of one landlord, one owner, saying, I'm prepared to sell this to you. And we don't have to buy it now. We've got, we've, actually on May the 1st, we took ownership over the whole place, but we don't have to pay for it until October 2019. That's, that's his sort of, 
That was his commitment to us. But we've got to raise the money to build some of the other things that we want to allow. Because we've got so many businesses want to come under the one roof. Because we know if we, if we can share, you know, instead of having 10 forklifts, we've got one forklift or maybe two. Instead of 15 printers, we've got three. Instead of, you know, whatever it is, all those startup costs, we reduce them down to one, two or three, we've got these shared savings. We've got the ability then to be able to deliver food affordably and pay ourselves well, frugally but well, um, and have a good time and, and, and give ourselves the financial freedom to sit down and have these conversations about governance, about getting along, about, uh, um, you know, take retreats. We can have retreats and retreats are really important to develop the deeper levels of trust the higher levels of communication, the clarity in communication that we need to have these conversations to create a, an, an amazing food system that might, that might, might, you know, save humanity from this from this uh, precipice that it's on. Thank you. So, thank you, Roger. Big round of applause. It's been such a great information, and we could listen to you all, honestly all afternoon. I don't want to push you off, but what we're going to do is I'm going to give you the roving mic yep. so you can take questions on the floor here. So please continue with this discussion with Rob, and we're just going to bump in behind you as quietly as we can. So just don't watch the feedback. Um, so, uh, I'll give you the mic. I just wanted to promote too. Uh, Oh, thank you. So the two, the two things that I just wanted to finish off on was um, uh, OREC is stands for the Organic Regenerative Investment Cooperative that we just founded um, uh, about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, and it's in the last week of its crowdfunding for membership. So this is designed very, very um, powerfully around um, capital to buy land so that young farmers can get access to land without having to use the capital to buy the place and the equipment and all that other thing. There's a whole bunch, so this is about, because private property is a system failure in itself. It's a huge system failure. The concept of private property is a massive system failure. And we need to go to custodianship, going back to our indigenous, the original people of Australia. They didn't have ownership, they had custodianship. And it was for the future generations so that's a really important. So this cooperative has been set up for that purpose. And then the other thing, which is really exciting news, is La Via Campesina, which is the world's uh, farmer movement of 200 million farmers that we've been engaged with now for about eight years, where we brought the first, we brought over three, four farmers from Timor Leste, Indonesia, Japan, and, and Korea. In Korea, we brought them over to Australia and so eight years now, later on, we finally, in next month or so, Australian, the, Australian, the first Australian farmer organisation will be given, well, we don't know, we hope they will, but they've actually been told that they'll be given all admittance to La Via Campesina. This is an amazing thing. Um, we're the last of the white, you know, America has got a group, the Canadians have got a group, uh, obviously lots of countries in Europe, but Australia has been holding out on having farmers uh, brave enough to say we're going to be peasant farmers, we're going to align ourselves with peasant farmers. That's going to happen in our next time um, over in um, Basque, I'm trying to remember the name of that, that beautiful city in um, Basque. Uh, the one, uh, uh, say, no, the other one, the one that hit my bomb on the farmer's market. Bilbao. Bilbao. Bilbao, yeah, in Bilbao, yeah. So that's, that's, so they're the two really exciting things that I just wanted to let you all know about and get on board um, and become a member of that cooperative. So that the, the interesting thing in the national cooperative law that's happened the last two years but no one's used it yet is a, is a thing called CCUs. So it's, it's, it's um, cooperative capital units. And what they give is people, investor, the investor class can invest in this cooperative and get a dividend, but they don't get equal voting rights. They just get one vote. So they might put a million dollars into something other, they might own 95%, but they still just get one vote. So this is separating money from governments. It's really critical. So that's the great thing of this new law. Unfortunately, Queensland hasn't got it. But I don't think New South Wales, I think it's only West Australia, Victoria, and ACT. Um, because uh, because of state bus, cooperative law is state bus. Um, so that's, that's a really powerful shift in how we can organise our money um, to support a new governance, a new power structure around how we actually deal with um, uh, property ownership. Anyone, questions? Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Um, I'll just say, I think the farmers are the best in class because we don't have a lot of farming in my valley. It's 2.6%. Oh, yeah, yes. And in the yeah. higher valley, of the road, I would say it's 4.6%. Yes, that's right. Yes, so it's just pointing out the fact that uh, the farmers are a peasant class. They're just not brave enough to admit it. But yes, we our, our return on investment in our uh, the um, I'm trying to think of a word that, that describes the um, the, the um, their leverage in the marketplace is very very low. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so a, even though GDP is a very, very inf, uh, um, fairy tale, yeah, bad form of, of um, measuring things. Just a quick question. I'm interested in knowing how many people employ in Brisbane are subscribers, yeah, subscribers yeah. and what kind of products do you have specifically on each of Yes. Uh, so uh, we cover all the fruit veg spectrum as well as all the cheeses. I think there's about 500 products now, um, all locally crafted by people we know or from, part, from those farms. Um, uh, I, think yeah, I think it's about 500 products, uh, maybe. Um, we wholesale about 230 products. Um, the customer base is hard to establish. Uh, it's, it's, it's around four to four and a half thousand, but um, because what we've done is the retail, when we set up the buyers clubs, the retail market was cannibalised because we set up those buyers clubs, and for good reason. Even though that was a business loss, we've got a lot. Of, we've made a lot of decisions that have been very smart business wise, but they've been very smart in terms of building the system. So buyers clubs. Uh, have basically, you know, a, a lot of our subscribers who couldn't afford the city cousins or were doing it out of loyalty for us, then jumped onto the buyers clubs because they're much more empowering and, and, and obviously affordable because they can buy at wholesale. So, uh, um, so we cover quite a few products. Obviously, we our strategy was because the farmers in Australia were. Um, you know, Victoria and Tasmania and West Australia with potatoes were dumping, you know, the market dumping um, thing that happens. A lot of Australian farmers are really afraid of dumping, and that's why I set up the three hour radius and then the five hour radius. That was critical to gaining farmers', farmers trust to say, grow the carrots you used to grow 30 years ago. So the onions, this, the Lockyer Valley used to be the onion growing capital of Australia. There's hardly an onion grown there until we come along. You know, we used to only have three months worth of carrots. Now we've got nine, three months without carrots. So it's been a, a, a strategy of building farmers' capacity to grow those things on the edges of the seasons to bring back those old varieties that could deal with um, deal with those edges of the seasons. But now we're obviously dealing with climate change, with the impact of climate change. Yeah. Two more questions. Two more. Two more questions. Sorry. <laughs> you might have to use the mic. Three if you're quick. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so. Oh. Any uh, regulars here? So, I'm a dairy farmer, so raw milk was our thing. I mean, I started with fruit and veggies and raw milk. That was the start of Food Connect. Um, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we've been a bit raw for a long time in that space. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've had all sorts of schemes to get around the regulatory um, stuff on, uh, on dairy, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to say too much because there's a camera. <laughs> yes, we managed. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We haven't. We've never gone. Maybe one week when we're. We'll edit that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so saying that the farmers are a peasant class. Well, yeah, there's different degrees to that as well. Which you have some farmers that are unfortunate enough to find themselves into the debt cycle, where they're yes. sort of locked into uh, infinite repayments of the debt they're not actually able to make money back off their efforts. Have you worked with any of them or helped any of them out of that rock? Yeah, um, uh, um, yeah, lots of conversations, particularly back uh, at the GFC time when there was a lot of pressure on climate because, because the Australian debt has gone up, it's ten, gone up 10 times in the last 40, uh, 40 years, so it's exacerbated. Yeah, we, We've um, sadly, even some of our farmers have, um, you know, comp uh, multiple factors, get uh, divorce, a couple of other things, so they have to leave the situation. Um, but uh, 
farmers outside of the Food Connect uh, have rang me, a lot of farmers ring me, a lot of organisations ring me, because of my own personal story of losing the farm. So there's that, that, I suppose, attraction to talking to me to find out how do I deal with losing my farm. Um, and, uh, you know, you just got to let it go. You can't, you can't, you know, go and shoot yourself. You just got to let it go. Yeah. And a quick add on to that. Oh, what's it? No, no, I remember it now, quickly. Um, just wondering, and you may have mentioned it because I came back, um, Aussie Farmers Direct. Yeah, yes. Comment on that. Comment on that. Yeah, they're, they're uh, no different from the supermarkets, really. Uh, you know, they're two rich white fellas with, with um, um, bench capitals running the show. Yeah, yeah. And, and nothing about them is direct. We've got, uh, some of our farmers have tried to go through Aussie Farmers Direct and there is nothing direct at all. Uh, and that's they get treated like shit. You know, they do all this work to get organically certified to, to go through Aussie Farmers Direct and it's, it's a really sad story. One of our farmers, a Kiwi farmer, well, the tambourine, you know, got absolutely treated so badly by him. No price setting, nothing at all. It was just pure um, arseholes. Yeah. We might have to leave that story. This, this fellow's got his follow-up question. I'm going to have to call it there. Sorry, we've got a bit of a tight schedule to keep to today. So. Since the 1950s, after mass mechanisation, we've had farmers losing their returns on agriculture. Yeah. Um, I guess this would be a front in which they're able, act, actually able to get a... That's right. Positive return. return. They're going to start bucking that trend. Yeah. Return. Yeah. Yeah. So when I set up Food Connect, there was those four things that I mentioned. The constitution had to have a, an asset lock. Um, it had to have a two to one ratio between the lowest and highest paying in that business because we'd seen so many cooperatives that were demutualised, corporatised, and the CEOs getting a million bucks and farmers are getting nineteen cents a litre. Um, so we had to have something that said uh, set the return. So we set it at forty percent. So far over our lifetime, we've maintained 50% returns back to the farmer, retail, back to the farmer. I um, mean, the whole side's around about 70%. Um, in some cases, it's up to 95% going back to the farmer, depending on. So we're true costs. So when you mention true costs, so how do you move the food system from a market-based commoditised system to a human rights-based system? Um, true cost is the big, the ecological, true ecological cost is the big that you have to place in the middle. So we need economists who, are, who understand true cost and, farm, and can teach farmers how to incorporate true cost, true ecological cost into how they price their product. Uh, but then there's all the shared things. So that's the thing about these collaborations is there's so many things we can share um, the cost of. Well, like at the moment, Food Connect will pay for all the freight because we know we can get better, better freight prices when we put this farmer's colour on, that farmer's colour on, that farmer's colour on and so on. So there's so many other things like um, uh, Gary, Gary Featherston, he, how many boxes are you sending down this week, Gary? Ten. Ten, ten boxes and then it goes down to Neville Sims' place and he'll put them on a box and then it comes up in a small, and that's the other missing component is the freight. How do we bring back those small, nimble freight, um, you know, truck drivers who are embedded in community? How do we bring them back into the system and give them gainful employment rather than being screwed over by Lynn's Vox and Lynn's Brothers and your other sort of things. Anyway. I'm coming to run. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for the conversation. It's obviously such an important conversation. We're going to keep talking on most of these topics for a lot longer than we've got time for, but hugely important issues and basic concepts like sharing and an economic system that isn't just based on growth. So quickly now I'd just like to introduce Maha for a little moment of pop-up poetry before we get our next act on the stage. It's a quick one.